in 1973, a man had gone to the river in Whitmore Village in Wahiawa, Hawaii with his friends to catch catfish. They laid traps in the river for about an hour, intending to return in the morning to gather the fish. As they were busy putting in their traps, they heard a blood-curdling scream. It sounded at first like a wild man screaming in the bushes right next to them. In a state of panic, the witnesses began to run. As they got to the top of the hill, running down a little trail, they came to a curve in the path. As they entered the turn, they all stopped dead in their tracks. An eight-foot tall man was walking down the trail, heading right for them. He was naked except for a cloth around his waist. They turned and ran back to the river. As he stumbled down the side of the embankment, a giant woman stepped out from behind a tree. She must have been at least seven feet tall. Turning down river, they ran until they came out of the ravine safely. Giant footprints were found at the site. I was camping in backwoods northwestern Georgia, near the Alabama border as a kid with my dad. I don't remember where exactly, around 1988. Hiking off in the woods, we found this old stone building that looked ancient. It was falling apart and covered in green moss and vines and fallen pine needles and leaves. There was an entrance with no door. The small structure had three rooms total, a main room that the entrance opened into and two smaller rooms on the sides. The floor was just dirt with all sorts of trash and plant litter. There weren't any windows. Someone had clearly set a fire in one room that burned the stone walls black in one area. While exploring it, we discovered a well. At least I'm assuming that's what it was because it was a huge hole into the ground with a bottom you couldn't see inside the main room. We're not talking a three foot wide well, we're talking six or seven feet. The raised stone wall around this well was maybe a foot and a half to two feet high. It was massive and completely pitch black at the bottom. We dropped a few rocks down it, but never heard a splash or them hitting the bottom. The smell coming from it wasn't like an animal died down it. It was weirder than that. I can't really describe it other than to say it smelled like decay and danger and very frightening. It wasn't a windy day, but there was a breeze coming up from inside the well and sounds that were very weird. It was a groaning and creaking, but not like wood makes. It wasn't constant either. It would happen for a few seconds, stop, but the wind from it was still coming up and start again. It didn't seem rhythmic enough to be machinery. My dad and I were very freaked out because when exploring the structure, we hadn't heard or smelled anything other than earth and must. But when we went to the edge of the well, the sounds, which were loud enough we should have heard it outside, started and so did the breeze. To say the least, it caused me to have a very bad feeling. The sounds were terrifying, especially to a nine-year-old. We took off and went back to our campsite, packed up and went home. My dad went to try to find the place again to show his friends, but said he couldn't locate it. We'd been camping off in the woods and not in a campsite, so we weren't sure exactly where we'd been, and this was long before GPS devices. To this day, I still have occasional nightmares about that well. I wonder what the hell that building was doing off in the middle of nowhere. I wonder who built the structure and whether the well was there before it, if they were built together or if someone put it in after. I wonder why the well was even there and what we heard coming from it. I have never been able to make sense of any of it. One time we ran from the capital during the war, probably best not to disclose the country name, and went up north to a tribal area, farms, water paths, wild insects, snakes, and all kinds of crazy stuff. People lived in mud-built houses. Usually open, deserted areas have all kinds of weird things go on, but people just got used to it. They told us to not be scared if we see something out of the ordinary, just keep doing what we're doing. One night we men of the family slept outside the house next to the farm water path. We had a small minivan so we had both slide doors open, hooked up a tiny TV to the battery to watch the news at home. My uncle and his brother-in-law laid in the van whilst we slept on the floor over throw sheets. We woke up to my uncle screaming and his brother-in-law running around the car and into the dark. 
My uncle got out of the car, yelling at us scared, saying he saw his brother-in-law peeking into the van staring at him with a wide smile, and when he turned to face the other side, his in-law was also laying asleep next to him. And then it happened, and true, his in-law woke up and got out of the car wondering what happened. We couldn't sleep until sun came out. We spoke to the owners of the land, and they said those are jinns, and they can manipulate people by being in different shapes, creatures. We didn't last for a couple more days living with fear, so we all drove back to the capital. But last year I had just moved in with my at the time girlfriend, now wife. She started a new job working nights at a hospital, and our apartment complex was brand spanking new, and it was built out on the edge of town, basically in a very rural area surrounded by nothing but crops and cows, and we were some of the first to move in. One other neighbor and I shared one entire building, and he was never home, so usually late at night it was just the dog and I, with nobody else around. One night things got creepy. It was spring break week, and literally almost the entire complex was empty. Emptier than usual because most residents are college kids, myself included. It truly would not be surprised if this night, I had been the only one in the entire complex, meaning I was alone with nobody around for at least 10 miles. Compared to some of the other stories here, that's nothing. I wasn't alone at sea or in the wilderness. But I was alone, far from help with nobody around for miles. My wife called me on her break and let me know we were in a severe storm warning. She freaks out and calls me any time weather gets bad. I would like to pretend to be Mr. Tough Guy who ain't afraid of no rain or hail or tornado. But it is a relief to have her call or be around when it gets bad outside. She called to remind me of our plants outside. It was midnight and I was really into a game of Dota 2. But I quit the game and went to go gather up our patio furniture and plants. The wind was picking up and it was pitch black, save for our dim porch light. Nobody near me was home that I knew of, so there were no other lights and just my car in our parking lot. It started thundering on my second trip from the house we had a ton of potted plants, and lightning started lighting up the pitch black parking lot which is when I noticed the man standing near one of the trees that lined the back wall of the complex. I got several good looks at him because it was lightninging so much. He was wearing black jeans, a black poofy hoodie with the hood up, and he had what looked to be a brown paper bag in his hand, which made me think, oh, he's picking up after his dog. Well, he had no dog, and he as it started storming, he continued to stay out in the trees by the edge of the complex. Finally, I noticed he had moved towards the parking lot, and then he just poofed. I couldn't find him from the window anymore, and I ran to make sure my door was locked. I sat back at my PC, still not really scared, just being better safe than sorry. I still thought maybe he was picking up dog crap, or maybe it was just a drunk college kid smoking a joint or something. In the rain. The more I thought about it, the less it made sense for him to be there and that is when I saw his outline on my porch. He was sitting on my patio furniture. He just took a seat at the little table we have and had his legs crossed and was leaning back. This is where it gets weird, obviously. I banged on our window to shoo him away, and he just stood up. He then turned and tapped back on the glass at me and sort of giggled to himself. Remember, all the while Mother Nature is letting loose in the background. The wind was horrible, it hailed for a bit, and he just stood on my porch and was now staring back at me through the window. I could see his outline through our blinds, but he couldn't should not have seen me. But he was staring right at my face. His hood obscured his actual face, but I could tell he was Hispanic and had a rosary necklace on. But from the nose up, I couldn't see. He then turned to my door and turned the handle, which is the point at which I decided okay f this shit and grabbed my gun i intended to open the blinds and show him i had it to scare him away or if need be take a shot through the glass it took me maybe 10 seconds to go to my gun and get back and i was of course in panic super shaky mode 
I honestly feared him crashing through a window or throwing a chair through one or something. When I came back, he was gone, of course. And when I went outside the next day, he had thrown something red and sticky all over my car. Or I assume he did. This event took place when I was 18 years old and living in Spring Creek, Nevada. It's a very small town about 10 miles from Elko, Nevada. I was staying at my friend's aunt's house, and that is where I was living at the time. I slept on the couch in the living room because there weren't enough rooms at her house. One night I woke up at 3 a.m. for no reason. I looked right into the kitchen from the couch and noticed the time. Then I swung my head to my left and instantly jumped and froze with fear as I noticed the living room door was open so wide it was touching the wall. Standing in the living room doorway were three, four-foot tall beings with heads too large for their bodies. One was standing in front and the other two were about one foot behind the front one and on the left and right side. There was a light coming from behind them shining through the door that was a white color with a tint of light blue. I was unable to make out their facial features due to the lighting coming from only the back of them, but there was no question they were there standing clear as day. As soon as I noticed them and jolted from fear, the front one zoomed over to me on the couch. I didn't notice how it moved because it was so quickly standing over me as I remained laying there. I looked up at it and of course my adrenaline was pumping. I felt a little hand rub my cheek in a comforting way and in my head, I instantly told myself, it's okay. Not even kidding the second it touched my cheek my adrenaline stopped and my heart rate went back to normal almost instantaneously which I still don't know how that is even possible. It's like it controlled my emotions by touching my cheek. The feeling I got when it touched my cheek was overwhelming love and comfort and happiness. It's like it was telling me to not be worried and it meant no harm. The weirdest thing is that I even looked up at it and smirked with comfort and knew it was okay to go back to sleep. Who would go back to sleep with some unknown being standing right above them? The whole encounter lasted only a minute. I am now 30 years old and ever since then, I have had roughly five to six UFO sightings that are undoubtedly UFOs based on them defying all physics. The first UFO I witnessed was with about eight other strangers at a gas station in the same small town, and I was 18 years old as well. I just can't recall if it was before this encounter with extraterrestrials or after. I still have a never-ending curiosity and still feel blessed to have had the experience with extraterrestrials that I have. I am sitting at work at this moment and felt compelled to share this with you, even though it was so long ago. It feels great to make others aware that they are not alone, and I too know what is out there. It was mid-December 2007 when Mom packed up me and my three younger sisters and drove us out to the family farm for a mini vacation. The farm, as we creatively called it, was about 30 minutes outside the small Texas town of Carthage and was situated both near the Louisiana border and in the middle of nowhere. 60 years ago, my great-grandparents lived in the house and had once had livestock and horses roaming the pastures. Now, after years of vacancy, it had only the echoes of its lively past. A dilapidated stable one strong breeze from collapse, weather-worn chicken coops covered in creeper vines behind the barn, and a well now capped with concrete to prevent anyone from falling in. Off the winding country road and down a steep hill was the farmhouse itself, and to our collective relief, it was in good order. My great uncle made a point to drive in once a month to check on the place, and he had done so religiously for decades. We had to turn the water on when we got there and keep an eye out for snakes that might have tried to escape the cold by curling up inside the fireplace or cupboards, but other than that it was a cozy little house. At the top of the hill was a trailer used only as secondary housing in case more than one branch of the family came down together, but it was rare anyone else ever visited. We were always alone when we came. Just us, the farm, and the woods. For those of you who don't know how big an acre is, it's close to 4,800 square yards, or about 75% of an American football field. 
and at 100 acres, the farm was abound with places to investigate. I often spent hours at a time wandering through the woods on my own, picking up rocks and making up adventure stories about why I was there. As young as eight, I would go tromping around with an ancient Daisy BB gun, plinking trees and fence posts at my leisure. This was also the time I was taught how to handle and operate real firearms and a few years later, at 12 I think, I graduated to meandering around with a Marlin 22 rifle of my own. I'd been taught not to shoot anything I wouldn't eat unless it was in self-defense, but I had no desire to shoot squirrels or rabbits even if I could eat them. I just wanted to have fun away from the suburbs I lived in. Away from mom who treated me like I was her always on-call babysitter. Away from my sisters who were constantly fighting and yelling about anything and everything. Away from the endless monotony of school. Just get away from it all. I would wander aimlessly for hours, rifle in hand, a box of rounds jingling in my pocket, and only find my way home after the sun was beginning to set. This went on for a few more years, now an annual family tradition to make the four-hour pilgrimage to the farm during winter break. When December would roll around, I always looked forward to leaving early in the morning in my thickest coat with my marlin, and not returning until I was too hungry to ignore it. But this year it was different. My great-uncle who had owned the farm for the last thirty years was now decrepit with age and had lost much of his memory. Knowing he was experiencing the onset of dementia, and ever the practical businessman, he passed the deed down to his two sons. They split ownership and one of them remained in Montana where he had a house. The other moved to the farm. When we pulled into the driveway, he was waiting for us with a wide smile on his face. He was a gruff but kind man, one who valued family above all else and loved to engage in anything and everything he could if it involved kin. It was this that eventually led to the two of us at the local feed store to buy hunting licenses. He had heard from mom how much I loved to shoot, and being a grizzled old country boy, former Marine, he simply had to take me out to bag my first deer. Fearing I would offend him if I declined his offer, I found myself up at 3 a.m. The next morning with a beat up old 3030 in my hands, we hopped in his truck and moseyed through the mowed pasture straight to the tree line. He told me to hop out and handed me a flashlight. Reluctantly, I left the warm cab of the truck for below freezing darkness. He asked me if I knew where the leaning oak was, and of course I did. It was a tall oak tree that had grown out of the ground at a near 45 degree angle, making it relatively easy to climb. He told me to go straight to it, climb up a ways and wait until it was bright enough to see. Only then was it legal for me to take a deer that happens through. I chewed my lip nervously but did as he said. I had expected him to accompany me. After all, this was his idea. But once I was out, he drove back to the house for some more sleep, and I was left standing alone in the night. Everything, and I do mean everything, was pitch black like someone had poured black ink into my eyes. There was no difference between open space and tree. I might as well have been walking with my eyes closed and blindfolded. I inched forward slowly, terrified of how much noise my own footsteps were making. Frozen leaves crunched under my boots, twigs snapped. In every direction I could hear movement rustling through the underbrush around me on all sides. I turned on my flashlight and immediately felt like the world was closing in on me. I was a beacon. Anything in the woods that may have wondered if something was there now knew for sure. My heart raced and I had a silent internal conflict as to whether or not I should turn the light off. I didn't like being visible. And not only that, my night vision was wrecked and would take an hour or so to acclimate, meaning I would be effectively blind after setting up in the tree. And this tree, I should tell you, is no short distance away. Even walking in a relatively straight line to it, it would take me nearly 20 minutes in daylight. But in the darkness, surrounded by watching things unseen. After what felt like a lifetime, unsure if I was even going in the right direction, I could hear the faint trickling of running water. This had to be the small stream that bubbled past the leaning oak. I followed the noise to the water, then walked alongside it for a few minutes until sure enough, after sliding between two trees, 
I came face to face with the old spot. Relief flooded through me and I couldn't help but smile at how scared I had been. I slung the rifle over my shoulder and slowly inched my way up the tree. The bark was rough and cold beneath my shivering hands and I continued up until I was secured in a small fork of branches. Imagine a capital Y and picture me sitting right where the limbs meet, with the two upper extensions close enough to support my back. All in all, for a tree in the middle of nowhere, it was pretty comfortable. And so I sat, arms tucked into my jacket for warmth, rifle across my lap. I tried to sleep to pass the time quickly, but the combination of cold and fear kept me wide awake. Every little noise seemed to echo off the nearly frozen trees and send icy pinpricks up my spine. I shut my eyes and pulled the drawstrings on my hood to tighten it around my face. I didn't want to disappoint my uncle by missing a shot at a deer due to sleep deprivation. Ignoring the nocturnal would be no easy feat, but I was determined to do so. That's when I heard the footsteps. They had appeared from nowhere, loud footfalls crunching the dry leaves. I froze. It was as if ice had been injected directly into my veins. My arms and legs became heavy and sluggish, my head light and eyes swimming. But my mind was racing. What could it be? It sounded big. The footsteps were slow and plodding like that of a deer or cow or a... I couldn't bring myself to even think of the word. It just wasn't possible. It was so improbable I didn't bother to even entertain the thought. There was absolutely no way, this deep in the woods in the middle of the night, that I could be found by another person. The footsteps stopped directly beneath me. My muscles went rigid and I forced myself to remain still. My hands clutched the rifle so tightly I was sure there would be grooves worn into the wood. I fought the urge to turn my head and look, fought the fight or flight response currently screaming at me to run away or shoot or do something other than just sit there. But I didn't. I stayed where I was, quiet as the grave and still as those who entered them. Instead, I strained my ears to hear anything and everything around me. I don't know if I was assisted by the darkness, similar to the blind eventually gaining hearing above and beyond ordinary levels, but I did indeed hear something, and it made my skin crawl. Whatever this thing was, man or beast or something else entirely, was smelling me, sniffing me, breathing me in with long, heavy breaths like it hadn't had air in years. And I kid you not, it touched me with what I can only assume was some kind of snout. It brushed against my back and shoulder, pressing on my thick winter jacket. My instincts roared louder, and my heart slammed against my ribs so hard I was certain this thing could hear it. Sweat ran down my neck and back, and my clammy hands squeezed the rifle even tighter. And then, like the flick of a switch, it stopped. The pressure left, and I heard a few steps crunching away from me. Then it was gone. No footsteps fading into the distance. No underbrush rustling as it was swept aside. No twigs snapping underfoot. Just silence. I gasped for air, unaware I had been holding my breath. Shivering consumed me, but no longer due to the cold. Winter had nothing to do with the chills that racked my body, and its icy wind couldn't touch me. I felt nothing, nothing but the kind of dread that you know will linger, that primal fear ingrained in our DNA to be afraid of the dark and the unknown, and I was in the dark with the unknown. The rest of the night passed in a blur. I didn't move, I didn't sleep, I didn't hunt. As soon as the sun rose high enough that I could see and the sounds of those that live in the darkness was gone, I looked around for a bit then climbed down from the tree and went straight back to the house in the most frightening intense walk I have ever experienced. I don't know if you've ever felt the exposure that comes with being somewhere dangerous. The gut-wrenching sensation of being naked and helpless with a thousand hidden eyes following you. I do, and it sped me along until I had suddenly found myself back in the mowed pasture. Back in the open where I could see far and breathe freely. Back where nothing could be hiding in wait. The farmhouse stared back at me solemnly, the colors washed out in the hazy, cloud-filled sky. I wanted nothing more than to take off in a dead sprint to it, where I knew there would be warmth and security. But fear still clung to me like a sickness. 
I rushed to the house as quickly as I could without running, for I still felt eyes boring into my back. On some level, presumably in the deepest, most primal part of my brain, I was certain that I was being stalked. My muscles ached and twitched, desperate to run, but my mind kept them in check, ordering them to go slow and show no sign of retreat, like coming face to face with a wild dog. I don't know if anything had actually followed me. It's very likely that it was all in my head after having something frighten me, and even that could have been nothing more than one of the very deer I was there to hunt. I make no claims to the contrary. After all, I did make it home safe and sound, and there have been no other sightings over ten years later. At least not that my uncle has mentioned. But it should be noted, before you judge me too harshly, that the spot in the leaning oak where I had sat, had been measured by my uncle prior to our arrival. You see, he had plans to hang a rope ladder there for an easier way up and down when carrying a rifle. And the spot I had stayed in, nestled between the boughs of those thick branches, where something had not only smelled me, but also touched me. Stands just over 12 feet off the ground. It was a hot summer day in 2016. I was hunting for ginseng close to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. I spent most of the day on my knees digging. About 20 minutes until night I decided to leave, and that's when I heard the loudest scream yelling I've ever heard in my life. We have black panthers here in New River and Oak Ridge. We also have black bears, mountain lions, and massive hogs. But this was nothing I'd ever heard. I felt it in my soul. I tried to run, but I couldn't move. It's like I was in shock, like I had just been through a shooting or a bad wreck. I was stunned. I finally made it back to my car only to be greeted by soldiers with assault guns. They were chasing something, and they thought it was me. They quickly realized I was not as big as what they were after. My family is from the big mountains. We can walk into Kentucky from Tennessee. I've been in the woods since I was three years old. Cherokee, Irish descent. I've been aware of and taught about hairy people. My family stories were passed down to me, and I always leave them alone. They won't bother you. But the bad ones live alone and will take our women and children. My uncle Jose, who is deceased, ran the security at the Y-12 National Security Complex, and he said they killed three or four every year trying to get into the plant. The old-timers used to tell us about the time one of the hairy people came into the holler and tried to snatch up a woman. They shot it six times, and it just stood there, grabbed the girl, and left. They never saw her again. Every week a boulder or a tree would crash through his cabin at night. This went on for a year until they finally moved. Once, I was hunting ginseng, and then I just had this overwhelming fear come over me like somebody was watching me. I got up, looked around, and out of nowhere this head pops up from around this huge maple tree just staring right at me. I literally wet my pants right there. I was frozen with fear. I ran almost like I was in slow motion to the car. It was running behind me and throwing rocks. I swear I've never been that scared in my life. My name is not important. I'm now a 64-year-old woman, but this happened to me when I was almost 17. I was born and raised in the country. Mom stayed at home and Dad worked in the oil fields. We lived in northern Oklahoma near the Kansas line. I had a younger sister who was a girly girl, but I was a tomboy through and through. I was the son my dad never had. He couldn't keep me inside the house. I spent my days on my horse riding many miles each day. It was my heaven on earth. Many times I'd take an after dark ride looking at the stars and enjoying the solitude. This particular evening, I decided last minute to grab my horse and take off, probably to get away from my sister or some other teenager angst at the time. It wasn't unusual for me you just grab a blanket only, no saddle, and a halter with a head rope fashioned into the reins and take off. I always had to put a bit in my horse's mouth. Off I went in a tank top, pair of cut-off jeans, low-top Converse tennis shoes, and normal summer attire. 
I had several dogs following along and maybe a barn cat or two for a way before they would head back to the barn. It was dark, but maybe half a moon and hardly a cloud in the sky, and down in the low 80s after a high 90 degree day. I had it out on my favorite six mile route that took me into the pastures where a small creek snaked through the sand hills. All along the creek were large trees and bushes taking advantage of the wet areas. I had my horse in a slow rocking trot with her head down half asleep, dogs panting along beside us and me with my head tilted back, watching an unusually active night of falling stars. All of a sudden my horse threw up her head and did one of those dead in their tracks stops that leave you up around their ears. I noticed her ears were straight up and staring at something. She did a quick back step or two and was shivering as if she was cold. I glanced down at my dogs and they too were looking intently off toward the creek. That's when I looked back between my horse's ears right where she was staring and I saw a movement as I watched a large hair-covered animal walking upright came into view about 40 feet away. I couldn't breathe. I was so scared I knew I was seeing something that didn't exist. It stopped in an opening between the trees and squared up to me, staring intently in my direction. It was huge with large shoulders and long arms almost to its knees in the moonlight. I could see its hair was on the thin side as I could see dark skin on it in several places. It stood swaying slowly back and forth looking at me. It lifted its head as if smelling me and stared at me blinking its large eyes slowly. I thought it was a gorilla cross with a caveman. About that time one of the smaller dogs growled at the sight and my horse did one of those nervous snorts they do. The creature turned its body back towards the creek and in just a step or two looked back at me and was gone out of sight. I sat there with tears running down my cheeks finally taking a few deep breaths. I turned my horse the three miles or so back towards home and off we went as fast as we could go followed by a couple dogs and passing a couple who had already headed back that way. We hit the barn door and I slid up my horse and collapsed, my legs weak with fear. I closed the doors and locked them, ran to the other end of the barn, slid the big door shut, and suited the bar to keep them from moving. I sat there frozen with fear. Being a teenage girl that loved her horse more than I can explain in words, I was determined to keep her safe. I worried that the creature would come to get her or one of the dogs, so I sat in the barn the rest of the night. At daylight, I noticed the blanket I used to ride bareback was nowhere to be found. I had lost it somewhere along the creek. I didn't say anything to my parents probably out of fear they would not let me ride alone anymore or not believe me and laugh at my story. I slept in the barn every night for weeks and feared that thing was coming to harm my animals. Every little noise would send my heart beating into overdrive. My 410 gauge shotgun was loaded and ready to protect my horse and dogs. One day with the sun shining bright, I headed towards the creek area. We were all nervous the closer we got to the spot where I had seen this creature. I spotted my blanket where I'd nearly fallen off my horse. I quietly slipped off of her, threw the blanket on her back, grabbed a handful of mane, and jumped back on. A few steps at a time we neared the creek until we were in the spot we had seen the creature. Since this was sand hills, there were no tracks, only large depressed areas in the sand. The dogs are sniffing each area, all the while shivering like they were ready to cut and run at a moment's notice. At that time I'd seen a branch that was near the creature's head when I've seen it, and it was only a couple inches above its head while I stared at it. I rode my horse to the branch, and it was at least six inches above my head while sitting on a horse. It was fifteen hands high, and I'm five foot eight. I have no idea how tall it was, but it was enormous. After a few weeks, I stopped sleeping in the barn. I would often check on her several times a night. I kept that up for several years until she passed away, taking a piece of my heart with her. This has haunted me for the rest of my life and not a day goes by that I don't think of it and what I saw that night. I've hunted and fished all of my life, but I'm never at ease in the woods. I know what's out there. I feel like I have knowledge of something that other folks don't. I've married and divorced and had a couple children who I have never allowed to be out of my sight for any extended time. Unlike me, 
They never jumped on a horse and left for hours just riding to wherever their hearts desired. A couple of times while hunting I felt a wave of fear and nausea come over me that I hot-footed back to my vehicle with it all in my head, or was I sensing something there? Anyway, it was a life-changing experience that has haunted me to this day. People find me hard to get close to, and I have no patience with stupidity. I now live in a city, but in the evening I can close my eyes and feel my horse underneath me, with the smells of the woods and go back to a time before I knew that monsters are real. I'll take this to my grave wondering what that was and why I had to see it and live it and live with the knowledge that they do exist. So my brother, myself, and our friend were driving through Vermont, heading to a cabin to go snowboarding for the week. I was sitting passenger in my brother's car when I noticed a bright red light its night in the sky. It was coming from deep in the woods, but was shining in a huge dome shape. The light did not seem to travel far, but its brightness was insane. We were so baffled we pulled over at this small gas station on the road to get a better look. There were about six other people who seemed to live there also looking at the light. They were telling us there was no buildings or factories out there whatsoever. Then only like ten seconds after I was told that the light almost imploded on itself and burst out with a huge white light that did light up the area. Then about ten-ish seconds after this change a huge wind gust came at us from the direction of the light. I'd say it was about 15-25 miles per hour winds I hiked and can make comparisons to wind on mountains. Then the light just began to fade away so we hopped in our cars and kept going. The light didn't fully diminish for about 10 minutes. Craziest shit ever. It was early in my hike on the Appalachian Trail. My partner had just dropped out from an injury and I was on my own in North Carolina. All day long, I was passing signs that warned that I was hiking through a bear sanctuary. No big deal, I knew the proper way to hang a bear bag and most bears are fairly docile, especially during that time of year when the trail is flooded with hikers. It was getting late, and when it became clear that I wouldn't be making it to a shelter, I set up my tent in a clearing near a stream, ate dinner, hung my bear bag, and went to sleep. Around 4 a.m. I woke up to multiple footsteps and the distinctive sound of a bear bag falling outside my tent. I tried looking out the screen window but couldn't see anything. My mind went to the obvious, but I swore I could hear voices. Rather than risk confrontation with a bear or some other wild animal, I stayed quiet and waited until sunrise to investigate. At dawn, my bag was still in the tree. But there was a new tent in the clearing and a family of people who hardly spoke any English preparing breakfast. They only spoke to me to ask where the water was which was marked and which way was south before disappearing. I have no idea why they showed up in the middle of nowhere at 4 a.m. with no idea of where they were going, nor did I meet anyone else who ran into them. I was hiking on a trail that isn't regulated by the park service, and we ran into a rock slide with the trail continuing on the other side apparently so we start climbing across it. We were climbing across for about an hour before realizing that it went on for miles, so we turned back and once we got back to our starting point, we were about a half mile up the mountain from the trail and out of water. We had no idea how we got up that high, but luckily being that high up gave us a bar of cell reception on my dad's phone, and we called for search and rescue. By the time they got to us, I was already hallucinating because I was so dehydrated. I saw the rock slide moving up and down in sheets like an escalator. I don't know how they got me out of there, but I'm still here. When I was 15 I went on a 10-day canoeing trip. We would drive three hours away from my town and then come back by river. It was me and about 18-24 kids in my group with me and three supervisors. Around day six we were camped near an old native settlement that was supposed to be haunted. Some people would say that they would see lights in the tree line or hear voices they can't quite make out. So we camped there spend the night and nothing happens. We all eat some food and pack everything up. 
As everyone was bringing their stuff down to the river, packing up their canoes, I was still packing up my tent because I woke up pretty late. While I'm packing up, I hear what sounds like a conversation between two people coming from the tree line away from our canoes, and it sounds like they're trying to whisper. I think that it's probably just someone from my group, and I continue packing up only I notice that whoever it is that's talking, they're both speaking fluent Ojibwe. No one in my group is fluent enough to talk like this, and me being Ojibwe and somewhat fluent, I shout in their direction, Ani, I hello, and then they just stop talking. I walk over where I think they are, and there's no one there. So I automatically assume ghosts and just finish packing. I must have been taking a while because one of the supervisors came back to where I was to tell me to hurry up that they were all waiting for me. And sure enough when I get down to the canoes everyone's there and we just leave. I told everyone what happened when we camped at the next site, and apparently no one else heard anything or saw anything. I can't believe I'm sharing this, and if anyone finds out, I might end up in jail. But the truth needs to be told, even if it's only recorded in the confines of a journal. It all happened in a war-torn city near Mariupol, Ukraine, a place shredded by the merciless claws of conflict. We, a Navy SEAL team, were thrust into the heart of this chaos on a mission shrouded in secrecy. Our orders were clear. Secure a key location, a biolab held by enemy Russian forces. This wasn't something you'd find on the evening news. It was a covert operation off the record. As we moved deeper into the city, the eerie silence was broken only by the distant echoes of explosions and the occasional scream. War has a way of stripping away the humanity from a place. The buildings loomed over us like silent witnesses to the atrocities that had unfolded within these streets. We pressed forward, our senses on high alert, navigating the labyrinth of destruction. The city had become a playground for death, and the enemy was everywhere, lurking in the shadows. As we neared the biolab, the air became thick with tension. We had no idea what we were about to face. The intel hinted at experiments gone wrong, twisted creations born out of the macabre fusion of science and war. And then we saw them possessed individuals, human-like creatures that moved with an unnatural grace. The creatures weren't alone. From the biolab, Russian forces emerged, their faces obscured by a cold determination that sent shivers down my spine. It was as if they had harnessed the very essence of fear to command these abominations. The battle unfolded in a chaotic symphony of gunfire and guttural roars. Our team fought with the precision drilled into us, but these creatures were relentless. It was a gruesome dance between life and death. Each pull of the trigger echoed with the weight of our collective fear, a fear we couldn't allow to consume us. After what felt like an eternity, we emerged victorious, the bodies of the creatures and fallen enemies sprawled around us like a testament to the horrors we had just faced. With cautious steps, we approached the biolab's entrance, a portal to the unknown. Inside, the air was stale, and the walls seemed to whisper secrets of forbidden experiments. We secured a vial containing a mysterious virus, a potential weapon of unimaginable destruction. Little did we know the true extent of its power. Back in the safety of our base, our superior delivered a chilling message. We were to remain silent about what we witnessed. The government didn't want the world to know about the dark experiments conducted in that war-torn city. The truth was to be buried, and we were left to carry the weight of that silence, haunted by the memories of a secret war fought in the shadows. Several years ago, when I was still living in New York City, I had a personal Bigfoot encounter. I know it sounds crazy, and the experience has converted me to an avid Bigfoot believer and hobby researcher. And no, the encounter did not happen in New York City but it did happen in New York State. I was living at that time in an apartment near my older brother's apartment in the East Village. We were both working for foreign companies in the city and were renting shared apartments in the East Village. My brother had recently bought a cheap old Honda for a laughable price, and because the car was such a jalopy, he parked it on the streets of the city, usually in Alphabet City closer to the East River. 
We got the idea to make a cheap weekend hiking adventure up to the Adirondacks, which is an eight-hour drive due north from New York City. The park is larger than the seven smallest U.S. estates combined. It's larger than Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, the Everglades, and the Great Smoky National Parks combined. The park is huge. You'd be amazed at how many people living in New York City don't even know the park exists. The park is amazing for nature hiking and hosts all sorts of wildlife. One can see species of birds and fish, as well as larger mammals like moose, bears, and coyotes. And after this hiking experience, I've learned that the Adirondacks are an absolute hotbed for Bigfoot sightings. I can attest to this from personal experience. Our plan was to drive up and split the driving so we each do about four hours. It's pretty manageable, actually, if you just go and stop for some breaks and snacks. Being that we both had just got out of college, we were used to roughing it and doing things on a budget. The plan was to stay in what we kiddingly call the Honda Hotel. The sleeping isn't so comfortable, but the price is right, and the view is spectacular. The view of large furry creatures that should not be there, that is. My brother Marcus had this idea that he was going to hike each of the tallest mountains in the Adirondacks, so he had already chosen our target mountain. After driving up, we parked the car, and the hike was amazing. We only saw a couple other people the whole day, and climbed through steep trails surrounded by old growth. We saw some cool birds and a few eagles flying over us when we got to the peak. The thought of Bigfoots had not crossed my mind, but later in the evening when the day was done, I can say that my senses were on alert. After grabbing dinner at a kind of hunter's den restaurant, we drove the car down some random dark forest road. We were looking for a place where we could park the car and get some sleep without anyone noticing. We didn't want to get harassed by the police. We drove a while, and going deep into a forest to find a safe place is like a double-edged sword. On one hand, there is safety in being out there because you can disappear on the other. We were two city kids in a crappy city car deep in a forest we know little about. We were also really tired after a long day of driving and mountain hiking. A few thoughts crossed my mind, like how I'd rather not get a visit from coyotes, wolves, or especially bears during the night. But at the same time, we were in a locked car with the front windows just open to crack, so we felt safe. And further, when you're in a car, there is always the perceived safety that we could just start the engine and gun it out of there. My mind was too tired to worry, actually, and I don't remember much from after we parked the car because I curled up under my jacket in the passenger seat and was soon in a deep sleep. At some point in the middle of the night, the car was bumped. The bump was felt like that trick people do when they jump on the bumper and the car dips down. I sat up quick and awoke to instantly being in a panic. I was disoriented about the place and time, but could feel my heart beating and eyes racing around dark forest scenery outside the car. My brother did exactly the same, and he said, What was that? Then the rancid stench hit me. We had left the windows on each side open to crack to get fresh air. The air was anything but fresh. The stench in the air was something like a combination of hot rotting flesh and wet dog smell. It wasn't make you puke foul, but it was thick in the air. I whispered to my brother, There's somebody out there. Let's get the F out of here. We really didn't know what to do, but we had no way of protecting ourselves, and at that moment thought it was some people or local kids messing with us. Marcus started the car. As our eyes had adjusted, we could see a little bit of the environment outside the car. It was a moonless night, but there was just enough light to see a dark forest in shades of black and dark gray, as the human eye sees at night. Then we heard it over the humming of the engine, we heard rapid footsteps move in the direction away from the car. Marcus put the car in reverse and the white lights at the rear of the car illuminated the forest behind us like bright spotlights. He started to back out. Not super slow, but not super fast either. As the car rolled back, my eyes scanned the trees and the dark spaces between the trees. Each second dragged and I felt like I was ready to flinch if anything sudden happened. After backing out about four car lengths, 
There is a spot where we could back into to use to turn around. Marcus put the front headlights on, and I saw it. It definitely was not some mountain people or local kids messing with us. We saw, partly blocked by some forest growth, the huge shoulders, uppers arms and massive head of a creature covered in black hair. I could barely see its face, but the eyes reflected back the golden light with the eeriest steady glow. Its demeanor was not threatening. It actually had a sort of on-guard curiosity. I remember saying the words, do you see that? And my brother turned the wheel making the headlights move their shine away from the creature, leaving it in the dark and out of view. Marcus stayed quiet. He muscled the steering wheel this way and then the other way around and we pulled out of there. I looked back and saw the dark forest scrolling back away illuminated red slightly from the rear lights. The area where we had slept faded away as we drove off. Marcus calmly said that was a Bigfoot. We stopped at McDonald's off the side of the freeway. We wanted to get some coffees because there was no way we were going to sleep in the Honda Hotel again tonight. As dim blue light filled the morning sky, we started to drink our coffees and talked about the experience as we drove on the empty freeway back towards the city. We talked about the experience until we had nothing more to talk about. Had the Bigfoot sensed our scent and came to investigate? Was it a friendly visit or could it have escalated to something dangerous? Could we have taken photos or a video if we were not freaking out trying to get out of there? These are things we'll never know. After many hours of driving and pulling off the FDR drive, we parked the dust-covered Honda on Avenue D. I felt a strange sense of comfort waking back to my apartment. The city has plenty of strange characters, some of them more safe than others, but one thing for sure, there are no Bigfoots in New York City. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.